Good afternoon. I'm Spot on Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. Welcome to How the Weather Works training series. This is part 11. And in part 11, I'm going to cover a very important tool when we talk about analyzing the atmosphere. And that is known as the SKU-T log P diagram. Now on the cover slide today of the training, I'm showing an actual weather balloon that's been launched. And there are certain key components of this weather balloon that I'll point out. Let me go ahead and grab my laser. Um, in general, of course, this is the balloon part, and it expands as it continues to rise in the atmosphere. Um, this balloon, this helium balloon, is carrying, this is the general um, wire or cord that goes all the way down to this transmitter box. See this little white box down here at the bottom? Now, this white box is very important because it has a has instrumentation tools within it. Um, it has a thermometer, uh, it has the ability to measure humidity, and this transmitter is going to radio that data back down to the Earth's surface. And so these weather balloons are very important tools used by meteorologists. They're generally launched twice a day, um, one at 00 Zulu and at 12 Zulu. Zulu time is the local time at Greenwich, England, um, at zero degrees longitude. And so meteorologists like to use a standard time. Instead of you know, launching balloons with using varying local times, we stick to the Zulu time. So what exactly is a SKU-T log P diagram? It is a thermodynamic diagram. And we talked a little bit earlier in the training series about the dry adiabatic rising of air parcels and moist adiabatic rising of air parcels and those various lapse rates. If you recall, um, when we talk about unsaturated air, the air parcel is going to rise at the dry adiabatic lapse rate of 10 degrees Celsius for every kilometer it ascends or descends in the atmosphere. For the moist adiabatic rate, that's going to be a lower rate, generally at 6 degrees Celsius per kilometer, as an air parcel rises as well as sinks in the atmosphere per every kilometer. Now, these dry adiabats and moist adiabatic lapse rates can be plotted on this SKU-T diagram, this thermodynamic diagram, temperature versus height. And I'll show you what this looks like as we move through the training today. Pressure is generally plotted along the y-axis, that vertical axis. We're looking at pressure in millibars instead of heights. Pressure overall, by the way, as you go up in the atmosphere, is not going to decrease uniformly with height, but decreases more rapidly near the Earth's surface because of major density differences. The way the surface is heated, for example, on a hot summer day, um, that lower layer of the atmosphere next to the ground is heated and it's very, um, let's just say, very buoyant, less dense. As soon as you go higher up above the surface, um, up, let's say, let's just use an example, 850 millibars or 5,000 feet above the ground, that density of the atmosphere is going to be much different. So to account for moisture variability as well in the atmosphere, we can assess something on the SKU-T log P diagram that's known as mixing ratio lines. And mixing ratio basically equals the mass of water vapor in grams per kilogram of air. And then given dew point, dew point is a measure of the amount of moisture in the atmosphere, in the air. But given that value of dew point, it's in degrees Fahrenheit, similar to air temperature, it's going to be in a degrees value. One can use this value to describe the amount of moisture in an air parcel. So the SKU-T log P diagram, it's known as a thermodynamic diagram because it illustrates exactly that, the atmospheric thermodynamic profile in the vertical. I've, I've really hinted at this in the past videos, how important it is to look in the atmosphere as a three-dimensional object or three-dimensional slice. If you look up, you go up from the surface all the way up to 200 millibars, that's up 40,000 feet above the ground. From the surface to 40, thousand feet, there's a lot of different things that are happening between vertical layers in the atmosphere. There's differences in moisture as we ascend or come back down towards Earth. 
Um, there's differences in the air temperature, of course. There's differences in the air pressure. There's differences in the air density in the vertical. And all these are very, very important. Different levels of saturation. All this is very, very important in assessing the complete three-dimensional aspect of the atmosphere and what's really the connection between the upper levels of the atmosphere and that surface, uh, what's going on at the surface. SQT is a great tool to use for this reason. Here is an example of a SQT log P diagram. Now, I want to go ahead and give my source for these graphics in this particular training. The source is NOAA. And they have a great, great um, training series. If you take a look at them, uh, if you just Google NOAA, there's a lot of great topics uh, that they offer. Um, this was one of them. Uh, so I've taken all these graphics from NOAA. Uh, generally, this is what a full SKU-T log P diagram looks like. And if you've never seen one of these, you would think to yourself, okay, this looks like a foreign language. This looks Greek. What exactly am I looking at right now? There's a lot of lines on this particular SKU-T log P diagram, and you know I'm going to break that down as we go throughout the training, so don't worry about that. But anything from these horizontal brown, solid brown lines, which indicate your pressure at various levels in the atmosphere. So for example, everywhere along where I got the red dot here, that's 200 millibars. Uh, this particular solid brown horizontal line is 250 millibars. This one is 300 millibars, and so on. You got dashed lines on here that represent some mixing ratio values. Um, you got moist and dry adiabats. Uh, you have your temperature, your solid uh, diagonal brown lines in this particular example. And then on the right here on the scale, that's typically where we're going to see the wind direction and speeds plotted as a weather balloon ascends up into the atmosphere and gives us those wind speed and wind directions. So when we talk about a weather balloon, we have to talk about the radio sound, okay? Uh, that radio sound is that transmitter, which is going to send the data, the atmospheric data, back down to the Earth's surface. Once that data is plotted, this QT will show temperature, the dew point, as well as the wind speed and direction in the vertical. There's six basic set of fixed lines that comprise this QT, including temperature, pressure, the dry adiabats, moist adiabats, mixing ratio, and wind information. And again, we're looking at this tool in meteorology to determine how things are changing in the vertical. What are my lapse rates like? That's going to help determine my stability for a particular day. Uh, how are my winds changing with height? Are they veering? Are they backing? If they're veering with height, following the hands of the clock in a clockwise manner, if I have a veering wind profile, that would indicate a warm air advection situation where I have warmer air moving into the area or between layers. If I have a backing wind profile or my wind's backing with height on the skew T, that would indicate colder air advection or colder air moving into an area or in a particular vertical slice of the atmosphere. If I'm looking at um, the difference between a rain versus snow situation in the wintertime. I'm going to look at the tool, the, the uh, SKU-T log P diagram, to tell me where my elevated warm layers are located. Elevated warm layers basically being those areas in the vertical that are above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, above freezing point. How thick are those elevated warm layers? How thick is my cold dense layer at the surface? Is it really shallow? Is it thicker? Um, you know, we look at all these different items to determine, you know, looking at the SKU-T log P diagram, we look at all these different variables to determine what's going to actually happen at the Earth's surface. Thunderstorm forecasting. What are the chances of severe weather for a particular day? Um, what do tornado profiles typically look like? What do just regular air mass thunderstorms look like on a SKU-T log P diagram? There are so many different ways we can determine what's happening by looking at this diagram. Right, so now let's break down on this QT log P diagram. Let's first look at temperature. All right, so we're going to isolate the temperature lines. And so you notice I have the blue circle checked off next to whatever we analyze. We're going to analyze all these features as we go through today's training. We already looked at the full skew T, and now we're going to look at specific lines that are very important on the skew T. First one is going to just be regular air temperature. Okay, temperature lines are drawn at 45 degree angles. 
with temperature values increasing from the upper left to the lower right hand corner. So every one of these brown diagonal lines represents a line of temperature. Okay, And they're generally in, um, in this case this is a five degree, uh, this is five degree increments uh, generally. Uh, this is in degrees Celsius by the way. Um, so this would be my zero degrees Celsius line right here, my temperature line. Um, so it's in degrees Celsius. Okay, just want to make that clear. All right, so generally the warmest temperatures are going to be the lower right hand portion associated with these um, horizontal diagonal brown lines, these, these temperature lines here on this QT. And as we go further up into the atmosphere, further to the upper left, these values get lower. Colder and colder temperatures are in the upper left-hand portion of the skew-t log-p diagram. Okay, so that's temperature. Now let's take a look at pressure. And I mentioned this already earlier in saying that we're now looking at pressure at various levels of the atmosphere. Instead of heights, we're looking at pressure levels. And so the pressure is the pressure lines are drawn horizontally. They're the solid brown lines on this particular skew-t. The distance between these lines the vertical distance here is going to increase as we go higher and higher up to the top of the atmosphere, the top of the skew T chart. And it ranges from quite a significant range here, okay, 1050 millibars all at the surface all the way up to 100 millibars, okay. So we cover a large vertical slice of the atmosphere for the pressure levels, okay. Um, in general, the pressure is going to be much less higher up on the chart and it's going to be um, much greater, those pressure values, closer to the surface. So for example, um, this particular horizontal brown pressure line here, um, that's a thousand millibars closer to the Earth's surface. By the time we get all the way up to the top of the chart here, I'm, I'm well above 150 millibars, up to 100 millibars. And so greater or higher values of pressure towards the surface, lower values as you go higher aloft. Next, let's take a look at dry adiabats. Now, they are going to be the slightly curved brown lines on this skew T, the increase in value, and they're in degrees Celsius from the lower left to the upper right. They're actually going to increase in value. So the lowest, the lowest values of dry adiabats in degrees Celsius are in the lower left-hand portion and the highest values are in the upper right hand portion when we talk about dry adiabats. These lines represent the rate at which unsaturated air cools as it rises. Remember that dry adiabatic lapse rate, 10 degrees Celsius for every kilometer? Unsaturated air is going to be referred to any air with less than 100% relative humidity. And unsaturated air, as it rises, it expands, it cools, and there's that 10 degrees Celsius drop in temperature for every one kilometer rise. Or if you wanted to convert it to Fahrenheit, it would be a 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit drop in temperature for every 1,000 feet in elevation above the surface. So these are dry adiabats. Think about dry just representing how the unsaturated parcel rises and cools with height. Next is the moist adiabats. Now these are going to be green solid lines, they are curved lines that increase in value in degrees Celsius from the left to the right. So the lowest moist adiabats are going to be generally in the left hand portion over here in this area and as you go towards the right these green curved lines the values get higher and higher. Okay, Moist adiabats are now going to represent that rate at which a parcel is going to saturated parcel is going to cool as it rises in the atmosphere. It's going to cool at a much slower rate. Remember that moist adiabat, uh, most adiabatic lapse rate is going to be lower than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Why? Because as the air parcel is saturates, saturated, it's going to release heat to the surrounding air in the form of a late heat of condensation. Condensation again being that conversion of water from a vapor to a liquid. And as that transition occurs, um, you generally have a release, a release of heat to the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, So moist adiabats, rate at which 
saturated air cools. Now, if I'm looking at this, let's just say I'm looking at a skew T. I'm going to cover this in a little bit. But if I'm looking at a skew T at my temperature and dew point lines, where those two lines meet is where the air is saturated. Okay, So I'm going to show you where to look on a skew T log P diagram to determine when the parcel would begin rising at the moist adiabatic lapse rate. And that, in that case, you'd follow these moist adiabats as the parcel rises. Next, we need to talk about mixing ratio. Now, notice mixing ratio lines are generally dashed lines. In this particular example, they're blue dashed lines. And mixing ratio is just simply the mass of water vapor compared with the mass of dry air. Now, the mass of water vapor is going to be less. Moist air is less dense than dry air, just to let you know. Just want to put that out there. Generally, the mixing ratio is expressed in grams per kilogram. And on a plotted radio sound sounding, when we get that data back, the mixing ratio at any given level is going to be the amount of water vapor in the air where the dew point temperature line crosses the mixing ratio line. All right, so and I'll show you what the dew point line looks like here in, in a moment. But in general, let's just say that the um, dew point line, let's just, let me draw this out real quick, okay? So we're just gonna take a look at this. All right, so let's just say my, my uh, air parcel is rising like this, okay, in the atmosphere. And generally, what this is saying, is to get the mixing ratio, uh, the mixing ratio at any given level in the vertical, remember as we go up in the atmosphere, these pressure levels are getting less and less, okay? So let's just say that we have air parcel rising you're analyzing it here on this QT, um, and we're going to reference the dew point line. Okay, the temperature line is typically going to be to the right. This would be your temperature line. The temperature line is going to be to the right of the dew point line. The temperature will never be less than the dew point. So this is a D. This is your dew point line. So the mixing ratio can be determined for any level in this vertical column, in the vertical slices where the dew point temperature line crosses the mixing ratio line. So let's say, let's, let's analyze this point right here, okay? And let's say that line represents 700 millibars, that pressure level, okay? So I'm just gonna draw 700. So this is my dew point line represented by letter D, and it intersects this particular mixing ratio line, which I know it's very hard for you to read these numbers at home. I mean, I'm squinting myself when I look at this, but it's a value of negative four degrees Celsius, all right? Uh, a negative four, okay? So that would be my mixing ratio. It would be right there. Because my, my dew point line is intersecting this particular mixing ratio line at that level, okay? Additionally, on a skew T log P diagram, we can get the wind data. Wind is generally plotted as staffs, the wind barbs, indicating both direction and speed, right along this vertical axis right here, right along this, okay? You're gonna get the winds, direction and speeds plotted as you go aloft. Now here is a look at some of the um, data, okay? Um, in general, we have our weather balloon again, and by the way, I'm going to be kind of funny about this, but this is what's always accused of being like those unidentified flying objects, UFOs. It's always blamed on weather balloons, which is kind of humorous. Uh, if you take a look at what a weather balloon looks like in the atmosphere. But anyway, <laughs> this, this whole line is going to unwind as you release the weather balloon. Um, so it's connected to the neck of the balloon all the way down to the transmitter portion, which is it's like a box that looks like this right here. See this white box? And so you have a line that's connected to this instrument box, okay, your radio sound and it's connected to the neck of the balloon, okay? Um, this, will eventually, this, this line here will be wrapped up kind of tight, but then as you release the weather balloon, it just kind of unwinds itself as the balloon goes up in the atmosphere. Right, here's a gentleman getting ready, getting ready to do a balloon launch in the upper right-hand portion, you notice? He's got the balloon in his hand, he's got it properly inflated with helium, um, so he's getting ready to do a balloon launch at this point. Again, these launches occur at all these locations around the world. See the blue dots here? Map of locations of radio sound observations worldwide. So anywhere there's a blue dot is where these weather balloons are launched twice daily 
typically at 00Z and 12Z. And believe it, not, believe it or not, this data does get into the weather models too. Um, so this data is ingested into the weather models. It gives us a great profile, a, a very accurate picture of the atmosphere and the vertical for a particular station, for a particular day. Um, you know, I have, I have experience launching weather balloons myself on board ships, and it gets really challenging on board ships um, because you have to watch wind direction, wind speeds. Um, so, uh, yeah, I have a lot of experience launching these myself. This is the um, UMQ-12. This is the mini raw wind sound system that is called MRS for short. And this used to be the thing that gave us the atmospheric data. Um, there may be some more up-to-date instrumentation now that, that does the readouts, but this gives you the readout of all the atmospheric data. Um, generally, the wind direction, speed with height, temperature, dew point with height with each level. Um, eventually, what happens is this balloon gets so big and large that eventually it will burst. And then um, this box will float back down towards the Earth's surface. And a lot of times, NOAA will put a little note on there on the box saying, if found, please return to NOAA um, for, you know, I don't know if they refurbish them or not. But in general, there's different sizes of balloons as well. You know, there's different sizes of 100 gram balloon versus a 200 gram balloon, balloon versus a 300 gram balloon. It really depends where you're launching the balloon from and the meteorologist knows this, um, you know. And you can also do special balloon launches. I, I mentioned that usually at 00Z and 12Z are the two daily standard balloon launches. But for special weather, uh, a severe weather event preceding that, um, generally meteorologists will launch a special weather balloon uh, to see what's going on in the atmosphere. And that helps with the model accuracy, the weather model accuracy, that ingested data. Uh, plus they get a real-time picture of lapse rates. Let's say we have a tornadic outbreak possible, do a special balloon launch before the occurrence of that weather, then give you a really good look. Uh, what, is, where your dry air, where's your dry air at in the atmosphere? Um, you know, what's your temperature dew point profile with height? How are your winds changing with height? Do we have a lot of wind shear or potential rotating updrafts between layers? Um, you know, so for example, let's say we have southwesterly winds at 30 knots at the ground and at 500 or 850 millibars, that same, that skew T, that, that, that balloon launch gives us wind directions and speeds, let's say at westerly at uh, 50 knots. We got 20 knots of speed shear between the surface and 850 millibars. Um, and we also have a directional change in the wind. So there's only going to be a lot of turning, twisting motion in the atmosphere. As updrafts rise, they're going to be twisted and turned. So these balloon launches are invaluable, just invaluable pieces of data to help the meteorologist. All right, so as that radio sound balloon ascends, it's going to record that temperature, humidity, and wind as it goes up in the atmosphere. Uh, a radio sound observation is complete once that balloon carrying the radio sound bursts. Once a balloon bursts, it reaches a certain altitude. That balloon is going to keep expanding and expanding and expanding because there's higher pressure inside the balloon, pushing out on the balloon walls. Uh, the surrounding atmosphere is getting less. Is, the pressure is getting lower and lower and lower as a balloon ascends. And so what eventually happens is that balloon just expands and bursts. Um, at the time, the data is compiled into a series of five-digit groupings containing temperature, dew point, depression. Now, remember, dew point depression on upper-level charts, remember I talked about that briefly when we looked at the how to read and interpret basic weather charts? Dew point depression is simply the difference between the air temperature and the dew point temperature. So we're going to get that type of data. We're going to get that wind speed and direction for significant levels in the atmosphere. Now, there are deemed certain significant levels in the atmosphere that we're most interested in. And an example of that would be, you know, 700 millibar level, 500 millibar level, 300 millibar level, 850 millibar level. Those are generally going to be your significant levels in the atmosphere. All right. So moving on now to the next slide here. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, let me make sure I didn't skip anything here. Okay, yeah. So now we're going to start looking at some of these lines and what they generally indicate on a skew T. Now I'm not gonna break down, this video is not designed to show you how to calculate where the level of free convection is occurring or where that lifted condensation levels at. Um, 
Uh, I'm not going to get that deep into things, like how do you calculate the mixing ratio lines like we kind of talked about already. Um, what I am going to show you is some example of soundings and um, generally what the temperature dew point lines look like on these graphics, as well as some of the other data, the wind as well, the wind speed and direction. But um, two basic lines you're going to see on the on this QT that are very important are the temperature line. The temperature line is usually in red, red color. So in this particular example, the temperature line is to the right. Remember that temperature line is always going to be to the right of the dew point line. Dew point line in this example is in solid blue. Okay. All right. So temperature is always going to be a higher value than the dew point. They at times do meet and become the same value, and that's where we have saturation occurring in the atmosphere. But in general, temperature is always to the right of the dew point line. Okay. Air temperature is going to generally decrease with height. However, there are cases now, special cases, in which the temperature is actually going to increase with height, and that is known as an inversion in the atmosphere. So what am I looking for on this particular skew T plot to determine if I have an inversion? You kind of see it denoted here with the arrows, okay? Anytime, I'll draw it out too here just to emphasize it, but anytime that we have, so let's just say this is the temperature profile, okay? Anytime the temperature bends to the left like this with height, this is known as a positive lapse rate, okay? This is a case where temperatures are cooling with height, and this is what we normally would expect. Temperatures decrease or getting cooler with height. That's exactly what we normally expect. There are some cases sometimes where we can get temperatures increasing with height. So when your line kind of bends to the right like this, it, it, it basically slants to the right with height. That's known as a negative, uh, that's a temperature inversion. It's a negative lapse rate um, in which the temperatures are increasing with height. So in general, what we're having here is whenever the temperature increases with height, the red line here on this particular skew T example, as well as what I'm showing you in the bottom right, that's going to be known as an inversion. So anywhere the line bends to the right with height, that is an inversion. Temperatures are actually warming with height. Now this is very important. It's important in severe weather forecasting. As you can see here on the left, this is a tornadic, a tornadic upper air sounding from 2011. I believe this was the one with, uh, associated with Alabama uh, super outbreak. But in general, whenever we have temperatures rising with height like this, these inversions, and there's multiple ones here, you kind of see how it's you know, going to the right. The temperature line is bending to the right with height here. It's bending to the right with height here. So I have warming and multiple multiple inversions in the atmosphere in the vertical on this particular day, this sounding when the balloon was launched. And what it does is for severe weather, what happens is an inversion acts like a lid. So if this is the surface and I have these updrafts rising, right? These updrafts are rising in the vertical. If this lid, if this lid, this temperature inversion is too strong, if that lid is too strong, that warmth, heat, and moisture, that's not going to be able to punch through to very high heights in the atmosphere. And that's going to act as a lid or an inhibitor, an inhibitor on um, severe thunderstorms. All right. Now, what happens if the lid is this inversion occurs during a particular part of the day, and then this momentum from these strong updrafts finally punches through this inversion and breaks it? The lid is removed, and you're going to get much stronger, much more severe thunderstorms, possible tornadic supercell thunderstorms. All right, so that's why inversions are so important to severe weather. They act as a lid. I th just think about this. Boiling a pot of water on your stove, when you put the lid over the top of it, it contains that heat and moisture as the water bubbles beneath it, right? As soon as you remove that lid, all that moisture just comes up in the form of that cloud, right? right after you remove that lid. Similar case in the atmosphere, the inversions, the lid of the hot, that, that water being boiled on the stove, the hot pan. As soon as you remove the lid, as soon as you remove that inversion, the air can accelerate very rapidly in the vertical. We could have um, thunderstorm tops up to 60 to 70,000 feet in places such as the Southern Plains. So that's an example of why this inversion is so important in a severe weather situation with tornadoes. Um, there are other cases where um, in the wintertime, 
If you get an elevated warm layer, that's associated with the inversion where temperature increases with height. The thickness of that elevated warm layer is going to be a big forecasting consideration on whether you get rain or snow at the Earth's surface. Okay, so wintertime forecasting, we look at inversions on the skew tees as well. It's very important. Now, additionally, the closer the red temperature line is on a skew T to the blue dew point line in this example, the closer the atmosphere is to saturation. So whenever they touch the temperature and dew point line, the air is saturated. What do we mean by that? The temperature and dew point are the same. Relative humidity is going to be near 100%, and you're typically going to get a cloud layer to form. So in this example, you notice how the red and blue line here, let me go ahead and get my other pointer out now. If you notice how the red and blue line touch at this point, in the lower levels of the atmosphere in this sounding, uh, that indicates that we have saturation occurring. So most likely we're going to have a cloud, some sort of cloud layer when this happens on a skew T. Um, the further apart the red and blue dew point, the red temperature line, that blue dew point line are, the drier the air mass is. So this is an example up here on this particular sounding with it's dry. It's very dry in the middle levels of the atmosphere. Plus we have these inversions. Okay. The farther apart those temperature and dew point lines are, again, remember, the drier the atmosphere. So I wouldn't expect much in the way of clouds uh, up at the middle levels of the atmosphere on this particular day. Remember the parcel theory? Just a quick review. Uh, in a stable atmosphere, the rising air parcel is generally going to become cooler than the surrounding environmental air. It's going to slower end its rising motion. Um, if it's a very stable atmosphere, in fact, as the air parcel is forced to rise, it's going to return to its original starting point. It's going to sink back down to where it started from. In an unstable atmosphere, on the other hand, the temperature of air parcel, if it's higher, or warmer than the surrounding environmental air, it's going to remain less dense, more buoyant, and continue to rise in the vertical. And during the adiabatic process, we assume again that no outside source of heating is added to the parcel. Adiabatic referring to the expansion or the contraction of air parcels. An air parcel will start rising initially at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, that 10 degrees Celsius cooling of temperature, with height for every one kilometer rise until it reaches saturation. And then after saturation occurs, the air parcel will rise at that moist adiabatic lapse rate, the six degrees Celsius per kilometer. It's gonna be um, less cooling per kilometer due to the release of late heat of condensation to the surrounding air, which acts to offset the air parcel cooling process. So on this particular day, I have a couple of diagrams, a couple of examples here on the left. The far left represents a stable situation. The, the right-hand portion of this graphic represents unstable, okay? So we start off with these little bubbles of air. These are our air parcels. Let's examine the stable situation first. With a stable situation, we have an air parcel with a temperature at 30 degrees Celsius. That's about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it generally matches up with the environmental, environmental lapse rate at this level. But let's say it warms even greater than 30 Celsius, just for our example. Let's say now it's at 32 degrees Celsius. And we look at 30, the parcel at 32 degrees Celsius, the surrounding environmental temperature is 30. This parcel is warmer than that surrounding environmental temperature. So therefore, it's going to want to continue to rise in the atmosphere. So it goes up to the next level that we examine in the vertical. And now that air parcel has a temperature of 19 degrees Celsius, and compare that to the environmental air temperature of 20, so 19 degrees Celsius, all right? That's actually going to be cooler than the surrounding environmental air, which so at this particular level of the atmosphere, I have a cooler parcel than the surrounding air, it's going to want to sink back down, sink back down to the, where it started from, so we have a stable situation. If I look at this particular example, um, where I have an air parcel at 8 degrees Celsius, the environmental surrounding air is at 10, again, my parcel is cooler, or that parcel temperature is lower than the surrounding environmental temperature, which results in a stable atmosphere. The air is going to sink. It's more dense. It's heavy. It's probably why I have a 30-30 here, because in this case, uh, the temperature of the environment and the parcel are the same, so it's really not even going to get kicked off and, and, and rise. 
But I just wanted to have it rise to show you and then compare at these levels um, the temperature of the parcel compared to the surrounding environmental air. Now look at the unstable situation here on the right. In this example, um, we have temperature and um, the temperature of the parcel and the environment are the same at 30 degrees Celsius, um, but there's some kind of forcing mechanism that causes the parcel to rise. Let's say this is heated again higher than 30 Celsius. Air rises, so now let's take a look at this level now. Um, in this example, we have a temperature of, let's see, 19 Celsius, and we have an environmental temperature of 20 Celsius. Um, actually, what we're showing you here, let me, let me backtrack here. Um, I'm showing you the, um, we're going to have to interpolate here. Um, so at this level, the temperature is 20 Celsius in the environment. At this level, it's 10 degrees Celsius. My parcel is actually above that 20 Celsius. Um, so let's say, let's say this temperature is 15 Celsius here. Okay. Right. So if I examine this parcel of air's temperature and say it's 19 Celsius, and then the surrounding air is, let's say the surrounding air at this level is 17 Celsius. Okay. My air parcel is going to be warmer and less dense and more buoyant. It's going to be warmer than that surrounding environmental temperature. 19 Celsius, uh, the environmental temperature is 17 Celsius. So the parcel continues to rise. And then once we get up higher in the atmosphere, let's say this level is 5 degrees Celsius. Look at my air temperature, or my, the temperature of the parcel is at 8. And I know my environmental temperature is between 0 and 5, and, and these between these two levels here. So therefore, my parcel is warmer and more buoyant, and it's going to continue to rise, and the atmosphere is considered unstable as the air continues to rise away from its original starting point. So really what you're doing is you're examining the different vertical levels, and you're comparing the environmental temperature to the temperature of the air parcel. And we can utilize that skew t log p diagram to really tell us how things are changing. What kind of lapse rate do I have? Do I have a positive lapse rate? where temperatures are cooling with height with my parcel, or do I have a negative lapse rate where my temperature is warming with height? All right, now moving on to a discussion on positive and negative energy areas, we compare the parcel temperature to the environmental temperature at the successive vertical levels using that skew t log p diagram. Keep in mind that um, we represent the, you know, the pressure, the height and pressure instead of um, values or thickness values and so you can see the various pressure levels here in millibars on the on the y-axis here uh, on the x-axis we have the temperatures in degrees Celsius um, in general we have an area sh that's shaded in blue that's abbreviated CIN that is convective inhibition and this is a stable area of a sounding of a, of a skew T sounding whenever you see the blue shading with the CIN that's your convective inhibition. That's, that's that lid that I was talking about. That updraft is not going to be able to continue to rise further up into a greater vertical depth of the atmosphere when we have this stable positive area on a skew T diagram. If I have the red shading here, okay, and it's abbreviated CAPE, that's going to indicate a more unstable. This is an unstable slice of the atmosphere. And by the way, CAPE stands for um, convective available potential energy and so this is telling me how how strong my air is going to rise cape the higher the value the more unstable the atmosphere basically in joules per kilogram so here's an example just kind of some additional things to talk about if the temperature of the rising air parcel decreases to less than the surrounding atmosphere due to its cooling the parcel would become denser than the surrounding environment that's negative energy areas. That's that CIN, SIN. If the temperature of the rising air parcel remains higher than or warmer than the surrounding atmosphere, that parcel will be less dense, positively buoyant, and will continue to rise. And this is called a positive energy area and indicates unstable atmosphere. So this red area, shaded in area, is the available, convective available potential energy and associated with instability in the atmosphere. The, the blue shading is a, po a, um, a positive energy area um, that's going to be associated with stable air. So you really got to get that, that, those updrafts to 
you know, this lid, this lid or inversion has really got to, you know, it's got to become weaker. Um, if this is removed, the sin area, the stable area, then you're going to have all this vertical area to work with, and that parcel slug is going to rise very rapidly, and you're going to have very strong updrafts and very tall thunderstorm cloud tops. All right, so now let's take a look at um, some of these indices that we look at when we look at skew T log P diagrams. Um, this is the GFS model, courtesy of Tropical Tidbits. This is a forecast model for soundings for skew T's. It's a great resource to look to see how the atmosphere is changing for your location. Um, in this particular sounding, the red style line is the temperature line, and then this green style line is your dew point line. So remember, the further apart the dew point line is, to the temperature line, the drier the atmosphere. The closer these are, the more moist the atmosphere air is, and the closer you are to saturation. All right. There's other values on here you can see as well. Um, storm relative holicity is SRH um, within various layers, uh, zero to one kilometer, and a deeper look at helicity or rotating updrafts um, between zero and three kilometers. Uh, you look at surface base cape, mixed layer cape, um, there's mu cape, surface base convective inhibition, mixed layer convective inhibition, there's D cape as well, and then there's um, relative humidity between levels, there's precipitable water values, P watt, see how moist the atmosphere is, and then you have your wind barbs on the side here, okay, wind direction and speed. So in addition to temperature dew point and wind data, a model forecast QT sounding can help to predict severe thunderstorm potential through the calculation of these various indices I'm going to cover and hodograph shape. Now this is an example of a hodograph, okay? The shape of uh, how the winds is really a measure of wind shear as you go higher and higher in the atmosphere. All right, so let's start with the bulk Richardson number, BRN. Cape, it's cape over the zero to six kilometer shear. If it's less than 45, the BRN, then that indicates supercells. If it's less than 10, the environment is too sheared. And in the teens, you have optimum, you're in the optimum area for severe thunderstorms with a good balance of cape and shear. Cape represents the updrafts, and shear is that rotation or turning of, that, of those updrafts with height. So you don't want too much shear because uh, then your updrafts are not going to reach, the energy associated with them aren't going to reach their full potential. Um, so you want a good balance between that, those updrafts and the cape, the ability of the air to rise, and that shear. The next uh, indice I'm going to talk about is convective available potential energy or cape. This is the positive area on a sounding, ranging from, if it's from 1 to 1,500, it's a positive cape. If it's from 1,500 to 2,500 joules per kilogram, it's a large cape. And if it's 2,500 plus, it's an extreme cape. Again, cape is in joules per kilogram. And you can see that here on the sounding on the left. High values of cape will result in high values of upward vertical velocity in the updraft region of a thunderstorm. Okay. Cape, how are you going to increase the cape? This is going to be increased by low-level warm air advection. Daytime heating is going to increase cape as well. Low-level moisture advection, you get high surface dew points in the area, 70 degrees or higher. And you get upper-level cold air advection. You get colder air aloft moving over a heated surface, and you're definitely going to increase your cape values or your ability of that air to uh, move upward going to increase the strength of the updrafts if you get thunderstorms to develop. Cape values tend to be the highest in the warm season of the year, late spring and summer. Um, convective inhibition, that CIN that I talked about previously, this is a negative area on a sounding, on a skew T sounding. A large cap or a dry pan, a planetary boundary layer will lead to high values of sin and stable conditions. Energy Helicity Index is um, abbreviated EHI. This combines the cape and the helicity or the turning of the air parcels into a single index. And EHI increases as cape and or helicity increases. That increases tornadic development, the probability of it occurring. And that tornadic development often initiates in a region of max 
EHI, Energy Helicity Index, especially if you have an EHI value greater than five. Here's a breakdown of the values um, for EHI. Generally, EHI five plus, you can get, um, actually let's start here, EH1 from one to five could indicate the potential for EF2 to e and EF3 tornadoes. Uh, higher EHI values, we get a lot of turning, rotating updrafts, mesocyclones. EHI 5 plus is going to indicate the probability of EF4 and EF5 tornadoes, the most destructive on um, that enhanced Fujita scale. K index is another index we look at. It's used in prediction of air mass thunderstorms. Now we're talking just hot summer day where we get those afternoon and early evening storms. We're going to look at the K index values. Lower values in K index in the presence of other strong thunderstorms and in, uh, storm indicators. If we have a sharp trough or a high level jet, that could induce severe thunderstorm potential. So for the most part, higher K index values, uh, more moist air in place, and let's say you have something moving to your area, a sharp trough approaching from the west, um, increased cyclonic turning with height, uh, high intensity level jet, you know, the jet max or jet streaks overhead, that could result in severe thunderstorm potential. It could turn those air mass thunderstorms into some more severe, uh, more significant severe thunderstorms. Lifted index Li, this is the temperature difference between the environment and the parcel temperature. And we look at that at the 500 millibar level on a skew T. If it's zero or greater, a positive value, for example, Li, that's going to indicate a stable atmosphere. Negative one to negative four is marginal instability. Negative five to negative seven is large instability. And then if you get Li values between negative eight to negative 10, you have extreme instability. Precipitable water, PW, um, on the skew T itself, on this one on the right, it's actually abbreviated PWAT, P-W-A-T. It's the amount of liquid water on the surface after all water is brought from the cloud level back down to the surface. The higher the value of PWAT, or precipitable water, the greater the likelihood for flash flooding. Um, so as moist air advection occurs within various levels of the atmosphere, it's going to induce higher PWAT values. The higher that PWAT value is, the greater the potential for flash flooding. And you'll see the National Weather Service talk about this in their discussions, what the PWAT values are when you have thunderstorms in a specific area. What is the potential um, from that PWAT value to flash flooding potential? The higher the value, the greater the amount of moisture within the vertical column of air. And that is going to result in, uh, yeah, some pretty significant flash flooding if, if all that moisture were to be wrung out of the atmosphere. The lower the PWAT value, the drier the air column. All right, so now in this particular um, example, I'm showing you an example of a snow sounding, okay? Now, these particular solid lines with the values, these are your temperature, uh, these are those temperature lines I mentioned. In degrees Celsius. So zero Celsius is a very important line you want to look at on a skew T. Uh, if your temperature line, the red line, if that is to the left of that zero Celsius line, that means the atmosphere is completely below freezing. Okay, And that's important because when these two, the temperature dew point lines here are close together, that indicates saturation. That indicates where my temperature and dew point are the same and the the um, greater the vertical distance that the temperature and dew point line are close together like this, um, I have a much more saturated atmosphere uh, uh, in the vertical. I have a, just say, a, a greater vertical depth of saturation in the atmosphere. That's going to tend to lead towards precipitation. But this is a snow sounding. Uh, note how close the red and blue the temperature and dew point line are in this sounding. Uh, note how both lines are to the left of this zero degrees Celsius, the freezing line here. Um, this indicates the entire sounding as a temperature below freezing, as I mentioned. And this is going to allow precipitation to fall from the cloud to the ground as snow and remain snow all the way to the surface. Okay? So that zero degrees Celsius line is a very important temperature line to be looked at as far as you know the soundings and how temperature changes with height in relation to it. A sleet sounding, on the other hand, um, notice we have an elevated warm layer. Okay. The elevated warm layer on this particular sounding, 
That's represented by this inversion. Remember that temperature line bending to the right? This is a fairly strong inversion too. Um, see how the red line here is almost horizontal? It's going from well below freezing, just below 900 millibar pressure level. Uh, look how it veers sharply to the right. And now it's to the right. There's a pocket right here that is to the right of the zero degrees Celsius, the freezing line. And that is going to indicate an elevated warm layer where temperatures are above the freezing point, above 32 Fahrenheit. So if I have a cloud up at this level, it may initially start out as snow, but as that falls towards the Earth's surface, that snow is going to melt into, in this above freezing layer on the sounding, and it could result in sleet, depending on how thick that um, cold dense layer is at the surface, how shallow or thick it is. Again, so on this sounding, I want you to know how the temperature and the dew point lines, the red and blue lines are, how close they are together, indicating saturation in the atmosphere. Uh, also, note there's Arctic air at the surface. We have well below freezing temps down at this location, right in here. That's some pretty cold air at the surface. It's cold and dense, it's shallow. Know how there's an elevated warm layer, as I mentioned. It's above zero degrees Celsius at this point right here. Okay, and that's generally occurring between 3,000 and 9,000 feet. So I have a 6,000 6, foot elevated warm layer. Um, those warming temps with height again is known as an inversion, a temperature inversion. So again, precip starts as snow as it comes out of the cloud, but then briefly melts to rain. Then it refreezes in the, um, this colder, shallow layer air near the Earth's surface uh, into ice pallets or sleet before reaching the ground. Here's an example of a freezing rain sounding. Um, now, I want you to pay attention. One big difference between a sleet sounding and a freezing rain sounding. Sleet sounding, the elevated warm layer was about 6,000 feet thick, right? Just right in here, right? In that location. With the freezing rain sounding, look how much more, uh, look how much thicker that layer is, the elevated warm layer, and that's above 32 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Both are associated with temperature inversions, that temperature line bending to the right. Um, you notice how things are very close to saturation. The temperature and dew point lines are practically on top of each other. Um, but generally, we have a uh, shallower area as well at the Earth's surface of cold air. That's another big change. And we have, in this case, an 8,000 foot elevated warm layer. Okay, so in the previous one, we only had a 6,000 foot we have a thicker elevated warm layer that gives that snowflake more time to melt on its journey down towards the surface from the cloud of the ground. So the precip starts with snow that undergoes melting, and then they have this very shallow freezing layer at the surface. Surface objects are uh, below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, so as the moisture falls and hits those sub-freezing surfaces, immediate freezing occurs. This is one of the most dangerous types of weather you'll ever see, freezing rain. It looks like the it may look like the road or sidewalk is just simply wet, but it's actually ice. And then finally, for the examples, I'm going to show you a hurricane uh, skew t log p plot. Inside a hurricane, the velocity of the air keeps the air fairly mixed. Temperature is going to decrease with height again, with minimal variations in temperature and dew point. You see how close the temperature and dew point line are to each other here over a quite a vertical extent of the atmosphere indicates a saturated profile. I don't have the winds on here um, on this particular example, but I just wanted to show you um, the temperature of the surface is very warm and moist, and you have a very deeply saturated area in the atmosphere uh, where you're getting a lot of heavy rain. All right, that wraps up the train today on the SKU-T log P diagram. Gave you a few example soundings there at the end of the training. I um, hope, you, hope you enjoyed the training today. Uh, we talked about this very important tool that meteorologists use, looking at the vertical profile of temperature, uh, moisture, pressure, wind speed and direction with height. Um, and, and it's a very useful tool, whether we're looking at severe weather, um, with severe thunderstorms, tornadoes possible, or wintertime rain versus snow forecasting scenarios. Very, very important <laughs> tool. So now I want to move back to show you to end today's training I just wanted to show you the um, Spot on Weather website once more. Um, feel free to take a look at our website anytime. Um, we have a lot of useful tabs um, that you may, 
really want to take a look at and examine further. Uh, we have a current weather tab. We can kind of check out the latest weather observation. Uh, the seven day weather forecast generally showing the outlook for the next seven days. Uh, we have that tab available. Uh, I will do blogs. I don't do them every day, uh, but I do do blogs from time to time. Um, in the summertime, I kind of decrease this based on the weather becoming uh, more benign. Uh, but in general, I do blogs. You'll see them posted here on our website. And the, you see the blog archive goes all the way back to November of 2016 here on the uh, right. So if you're ever interested in a significant period of weather across southeastern Virginia, um, generally the mid-Atlantic, this would be the area to look at, the past archive blogs. Um, in general, I've got a photo gallery here as well you can take a look at. Um, you can just kind of thumb through the presentation of the different photographs that I have posted on the site. In addition, uh, I save all the National Weather Service synoptic discussions if you ever want to look at what was happening on a particular day. I got an extensive archive dating back to May of 2019 here on the right. In addition, I save all the daily weather maps from the Weather Prediction Center. Um, and that goes all the way back to April of 2020. So if you want to look at the weather where you live in the United States for a particular day, you can do that by clicking on this daily weather maps tab. And there's plenty more. Um, I won't go over each of these, um, but I do save daily, I save daily satellite images. Um, I save daily U.S. precipitation reports, U.S. temperatures, if you want to know if it was hot or cold for specific days in the past. In addition to that, I have a weather archive tab, you, which shows all the past data. <clears throat> weather research, interesting weather research links, weather training. Uh, weather links in general will give you like a one-stop shop for all the different weather links um, that are very useful to use. And then towards the bottom of that, I this tab I've got um, I've got more of the winter type stuff. I still got past weather events on here as well. But my main focus when we do the forecasts here is for uh, the Mid Atlantic and Southeastern Virginia primarily. Um, but I do sometimes um, detail what's going on across the whole United States as well. But this is a really cool website that we put a lot of time and effort into. Um, it's just search spot on weather Weebly on the Google uh, tab and it'll bring our website right up. And I just want to end today's training by showing you the website. Take a look at it uh, when you have a few minutes. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. And if you have some feedback or would like to see certain things on the website, we definitely are open to suggestions. So feel free to contact us. Uh, one more thing I wanted to mention is you can subscribe to our, our blog here at the bottom of the main page. Just filling out your first name, last name, and the email, and just click Submit. And the webmaster here will get that, and then he'll go ahead and add you to the email distro list. And you'll be getting our newsletters, which are issued every Thursday, detailing the wet, latest weather. But overall, I thank you again for your time, and thank you so much for subscribing to the Spot on Weather YouTube channel. I greatly appreciate it. Um, and with that, I'm going to end today's training. And I wish everybody a wonderful Memorial Day tomorrow. And uh, looking forward to more training in the future. Take care, everybody. Hopefully you found this training useful. Take care and God bless everyone.